JavaScript. I had an awesome talk tonight. I've heard a lot of really good things about it, so I'm really excited. Uh, but before we begin, begin uh, standard protocol. Uh, does anyone have any jobs, or does anyone have any announcements? Nobody is trying to hire anybody. There's always somebody trying to hire somebody here. Arles is looking for interns at some front. If you guys are interested. Not getting bits of their fears. Interactive intelligence has a job posting. All right. Well, the next uh, is anyone looking for a job? Uh, we, we are looking for uh, people, practicants, uh, web developers, um, media um, media. Posting on the website, okay. Cool. Okay. Well, uh, announcement from us: the next meetup is going to be March twenty second, right? Yeah. And we are going to be talking about uh, drones and controlling oh, JavaScript. So it'll be really cool. The speaker is actually right here. So uh, really exciting. I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, and hopefully, we see you then as well. Uh, yeah. Well, one, one more thing. So if we did another, uh, I think we do this occasionally, and we've sort of been slacking the beer.js. Is that things? Is that something you guys are? OK. <laughs> um, so here, here's the big question. Is Raleigh or Durham? Because there's unless somebody knows of a good beer place in between Raleigh and Durham, I'd like to hear it. Um, but I mean, we've done the beer garden. We've done full steam in Durham. If anybody has any suggestions on where they would like to go, I think somebody mentioned trophy once, but I think you can fit eight people in there. <laughs> um, so if anyone has any suggestions, just send us a message and we'll, we'll, we'll get on it. OK. Cool. Good? Good? All right. So hello, guys. How's it going? Good? Good? You got some pizza? I don't see a lot of energy on you guys. So I'm just wondering. <laughs> like the old teenage you to need the turtle set. Pizza time. All right, so, okay. I'm going to quickly <clears throat> now start. So tonight's talk, it's a little bit of the, well, it's, it's a mix of everything. It's uh, about my experience with uh, 3D on the web, uh, some of the cool things that we're doing uh, with Autodesk, and also uh, live kind of demo coding of how to host uh, in kind of like less than 15 minutes, your 3D CAD model and your own website. So using an OJS server as a backend. And um, so first, I'm going to quickly ask how many of you guys know who Autodesk is? Cool. OK. How many of you guys know more than one product from Autodesk? <laughs> OK. Usually, the product that people know it's AutoCAD, and uh, some other ones know 3ds Max. Then we have Maya, Revit, and it keeps going. Long list, right? Um, so, 
I'm a dev tech engineer at Autodesk. It's, it's kind of like a strange title, actually. It, and the reason of it is because I have actually two titles in, in the company. Uh, I'm a senior software consultant, so I help clients with the use of our APIs uh, for desktop softwares and mainly on the AEC industry, which is the architecture construction engineer industry. And then also part of my job is also to come to this kind of events and talk to you guys about some of the things that we've been doing at Autodesk and some of the things that uh, personally I'm actually working on. OK? Uh, I saw a lot of people actually following this week from North Carolina, so I appreciate that. I hope I don't get you guys uh, bored <laughs> about some of the stuff that I post on it. And um, so we're going to start with why 3D for me is actually important. So if you if you think about it, this we have two eyes, right? So everything we see around it, we see it in 3D. We have like depth of field. We have different angles of camera for our eyes and see how far things are and what are the shapes of the things that we're seeing. Everything, right? Um, so for for quite some time, we try to move from having books, books as our source of of content. So whenever we wanted to find new content, what we were doing was flipping pages. And at the same time, all the content on it, it was completely flat. OK? Um, so at some point, also, we thought that that actually was over when we moved to the web. But honestly, I don't think actually happened. So when we moved to the web, we thought we, were, we left books outside and we ended up just seeing new content and websites. So again, the same concept, right? If you want a new content, we click on a page, we move into a new one, and everything keeps being flat. Um, so some of the first show, show up of 3D on the web, uh, I'm 29 years old. I think this came out 1995, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> Ali McBeal made it quite big, uh, the cha-cha baby, all right? And when I saw this, when I was a kid, it just blew my mind. Like, I, I kind of saw something that was behind the screen dancing there. Yes? Prior to this, the, um, it was in the 80s. I was not born yet. Yeah, I know. It was going <laughs> way back, but there was uh, this company called Amiga. Uh -huh. And what they had was uh, a ray traced juggler. So the cool. juggler was juggling three glass balls with ray trace background in the background. And that was the first real example of um, popular ray tracing with the outside guys. So next time, I'm probably going to switch it with that one. That yeah. <laughs> I will probably need to find out about it. Okay? So. And nowadays, what do we have? We have something like this, right? This kind of interaction happens in our websites now. What does that make you feel? You want to play with this thing a little bit more, right? <laughs> Honestly, like just something simple, like follow my mouse. Something like that. This is happening in your website. Actually, it's embed in my presentation. Okay, so this like becomes for for designers. There always has been like certain problems with this, and the different kinds of designers we have today. It's uh, so we have visual designers that use a lot of like Photoshop, <coughs> Illustrator tools. We have the interior designers, like I mentioned, they use AutoCAD. We have uh, right now SolidWorks Fusion for industrial design. And we have Revit for architects. Okay? So the workflow of this kind of goes like this. So the designer <coughs> makes up a design, right? Spends quite some time. Go ahead. Don't worry about it. No, oh, no, it's okay. It's a meetup. It's not like some big conference or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> right? And so the designer makes up this design. And I don't know, is any of you guys here a designer by any chance? You spend a lot of time making this thing to look beautiful. A lot. Okay? So 
once that happened, you send this design to your client. And if he doesn't have the tool, this creates a problem. Because he needs to figure it out what software to download in order to check this design out. And we're talking about, for example, AutoCAD. An AutoCAD license, if you're not a student, which by the way, every single AutoCAD software for students is free. If you're not a student, I think it goes around seven or eight thousand dollars, something like that. Pretty expensive, right? So there is still a, like some proprietary formats out there. We have STLs, OBJs. And STLs are pretty famous right now with all the introduction of 3D printing. Okay? And um, so this this creates a problem basically. What is what is this problem? So we get like extremely lossy files. What does this mean? So think about it like you take a picture with this new Nikon and you put the file in your computer and then it's a big file. It's like 12 megabytes, something like that. You want to upload it somewhere, you see that it kind of gets reduced. Or let's say you open it in Paint, you save it. You see the file gets reduced too. The picture looks the same. But if you want to like print it and blow it up, the quality of the picture is not the same anymore. So this is what it's called like glossy mess. And often these designs, when we're talking about CAD designs, for example, how many of you guys know what CAD is? Okay, so for the ones that doesn't know, they're computer aided designs. Okay? And so this designs comes with metadata, something that for our clients or just for you as well, it's very important because it has information about each part of the design, such as the height, the width, a unique ID in order to identify it later on in your database, and things like that. So what happens with this client? He's like, yeah, you know what? I don't have the software. So please, can you render it in images and send it to me over a PDF? So what happens with that? We're not from the past anymore, OK? <laughs> We're not from there. And um, it, just, it just, I think, the designers spend a lot of time creating this kind of things in order for you to have to lower down to render it into a PDF, OK? So but now we have something like this. So, so I'm kind of like transitioning from design <laughs> into web now. So we have WebGL. How many of you guys know WebGL here? How many of you guys are masters in WebGL? <laughs> Me neither. Don't worry about it. OK? So <clears throat> for the ones that doesn't know what WebGL is, so it's a JavaScript API that lets you render 3D in your browser. It's not a W3C standard, but even though everybody actually supports it, OK? And like I said, it's a really difficult technology to master. So a little <clears throat> example of WebGL, I show just a cube, crazy cube going around. And it's not doing anything. It's just bouncing. I don't have interaction with it. But it's starting to give you that sense of feeling of 3D happening in your website, right? Same as the baby. You're seeing something behind. I think it's a little bit foggy because it kind of goes away. It comes back. All right? But you get the idea. So would you like to see this code? Last chance. Do you want to see this code? Yes. All right, cool. So the code kind of looks like this. So we use a canvas in order to render this uh, 3D content on it. And then we have a lot, but a lot of vectors, shader coder, um, loops, all kinds of things that you can think of. And Try not to focus on whatever it's saying here. Just check these numbers here. I keep going, right? And it doesn't stop. <laughs> yeah. So this is just for the function. Then if we want to do the index HTML to put the cameras in it, more code, right? So like I said, it's kind of difficult to master. And 
basically sometimes it turns out to be a hell. All right. So, <clears throat> but then we have 3JS. How many of you know what 3JS is? Cool. So 3JS has a simpler way to create the same cube. Not the bouncy one around, but just a small cube that will rotate. So again, I'm going to quickly take a look at this code, and then I'm going to run it. So if you can see, this is just an HTML page. We have an HTML page here where we have the title, style of our canvas, and then we have the scripts. That for 3JS, we need to set up a scene. We need to set up a camera. And if you guys cannot see it, please tell me. I will make it a little bit bigger. Perfect. Yeah, thank you. Please, the ones in the back, tell me about it, because other than that, I see it fine here, but you guys are far away. <laughs> Again, the depth of view, perspective, and all that. Um, so we have the scene, the camera, the render, and then just adding this to the to the DOM with a, a cube rotation. Okay. I will make this bigger right now. But basically, it's actually the same code. Okay. So this running the same cube, okay? Different colors, I know, but you kind of get the idea. How many lines of code do we have here? Oh, wrong one. Thirty-nine. Okay, that makes a lot of difference, right? We probably cut it by more than four hundred percent. Okay, so. You started to get the, the idea of like, all right, so 3D to be put up in our website is actually not that difficult. But not everybody wants to put a cube in the website. They want to look something like the robot that I previously showed you, right? So like I said, we came out this with, with this 3D, 2D viewer. And viewers, there's many. Don't, don't, don't think, and I'm not saying, oh, we're the only ones that do this. No, no, no. There's, there's many. There's a lot of them. And they're, some other ones that are actually pretty good. Well, what makes this one special? Well, the set of APIs that we have for this kind of thing lets you access the data on it. that metadata that it's from the CAD model, very important as well. So we have two sets of APIs, the REST API, the JavaScript API. Um, I will talk a little bit more about them and walk you through the, the sample of how they actually work, OK? And the best thing about it right now, it's free. Okay, so if you guys want to give it a shot, try it. But yeah, okay, I'm talking about the viewer, but you guys haven't seen the viewer. So when we have an e-commerce website, <clears throat> this is kind of like the experience we get. So we have, uh, we want to buy a bicycle. This is a pretty expensive bicycle, to be honest. Uh, maybe that's one of those Harrow bikes or something like that. They're professional ones. And you have options of pictures that you can switch and add to cart, and that's it, All right? What about if your e-commerce website will have something like this? What do you think of that? Like, for me, if I'm buying a bicycle, I can just go inside. And, I'll pay $2,500 oh. for that bike. Wow. Oh, hell yeah. yeah. You can put more price on it, exactly. So, all right, let's say I, I care about the seat. I'm a big guy. I need a big seat. All right, now, like, you don't want to know. So I want to check out the seat. I want to check out the tires. And let's say I want to do check out piece by piece. You can do that, too, right? So what do you think of that? I think it, it will be a better experience in your e-commerce website in order to create and have these kind of models. And those models are available. Why? Because the final product exists and exists in real life. So that got designed, yes, probably got designed with the starts of drawings and all that. But in this era, we're making this a 3D model as well. So th they already exist. Some other people even, it's actually 3D printing these kind of parts. So the, the pieces are there. The model is there. It's up to you to actually wrap it and put it up on a website to make your customer's experience a lot better. So 
like I said at the beginning, uh, I come from AEC industry. So I have more experience when it comes to between manufacturing and construction. Construction is kind of my thing. So I like this kind of things. So for example, this, this is not my house, I wish, but it's not. And we have a 3D model here, okay? And since the API that I'm showing you today lets you customize the UI completely of the, the viewer part, you can add as many things as you want. Any, anything that you can think of as JavaScript extensions can be added to it. So in this case, this is a Revit model. And a Revit model comes with something that's called 2D view sheets. This is a 2D view sheet. So this is the 2D plane of our house here. So let's say I want to see from the inside of the house. Okay. So by just clicking where it is, this data is connected to the one in the 3D model as well. If I select something and I want to see the properties, I have access to that as well. Okay. This television probably doesn't have that many, but the basic wall kind of has a lot more. Okay, I can navigate inside of this by just grabbing the arrow. Let's say let's go to the kitchen. Select another thing, one of these tools, uh, bar tools. Let's see again, bar chair, properties of it. So all this data that is accessible from the from the API and you guys can use it. Okay. So now let me show you some other samples that we have. I have a question. Yeah. Do you, do you have any of your customers concerned that the model is is too good that they're showing the customers and that they're actually leaking proprietary information to or somebody to take their entire design off of the web and start 3D printing it themselves? Has anybody voiced that in the beginning? I'll get into that, and that way I can convince you that it can be a vote in some, in some way. Okay? So, um, IoT, for example, how many of you guys do IoT here or have interested in it? I have a lot of interest in it actually. And at the end of the presentation, I'm gonna do I'm gonna do one of those Twitter polls, I guess, but I'm gonna do it live. So I'm not gonna use Twitter this time. <laughs> it's to ask you for some feedback and some of the things that I'm planning to work in the upcoming months as my new sample using this. Okay, so um, in San Francisco we have PR9, which is uh, an Autodesk facility uh, design, uh, designed for makers. So makers come into here and create these awesome new things, all kinds of different things. We have a lot of uh, CNC machines inside of the, of the PR9. And what we have done is, again, using the same technology that I'm showing you, um, we have sensors that tells us uh, about the, the machines that we have running in it. So right now it's 728 San Francisco. People tend to leave a little bit early there. So it seems like it's actually turned off. But again, we can see properties of this of this machine. You can embed this kind of content in here. So there's a lot of possibilities of things that you can do with with the viewer itself, the UI itself. Okay. Um, how many of you guys have bought something from Ikea before? It's a pain, right? <laughs> to put together? I think an Ikea business should be a lower uh, cost for them to actually build your things. And I think, I'm pretty sure at some point they will make more money from it. So same thing again, right? This is a simple wine rack. Uh, Loaded in the viewer by one of our customers. The name is actually Dottie. It's an Australian company. And this kind of takes you for the, the different states of the of the interaction of how to put together this kind of this kind of wine rack. Okay. If I see this, I understand it better than the manual. Again, moving away from 2D manual, 3D 
manual. Okay. How many of you would like to see this instead of? Okay. The other ones, I'm pretty sure you guys are pretty good at it, so that's fine. <clears throat> or we just could print one language of the manual instead of all things up. <laughs> that too? Okay. So, okay, so a little bit of the list of the supported files that we have. It's a very like ongoing list of things. And uh, we support over 50 plus, and I think it's growing day by day. And the fun thing about it is that we not only support Autodesk files, we support other ones too. SolidWorks, which is one of the big ones to do manufacturing design and all that. Rhino, Katia, uh, what else? There's quite some other ones out there. And this list keeps growing, okay? So at some point, if we don't support some of them, they might become available. So I hope by this point, you're starting to think, yeah, I'm sold. Actually, I want my website to look like that. How do I get started? Simpler, developer.com, in order to request your set of keys, which I will talk in a little bit right now with the demo. And please, by all means, the fact that I come here and talk to you guys about this doesn't mean I'm going to be an a stranger after I leave, so you guys can connect mm -hmm. with me, and I'm willing to keep talking for all the questions that you guys might be shy to ask today. OK? <clears throat> so let's dive deep a little bit more into this 3D world using this API. Oh, sorry. So we have the server-side API, which takes care of the uploading of your model that gets authenticated first with your set of unique keys to the Autodesk cloud servers, OK? Then the translation happens. Since we support quite a few number of files, we need to have um, a general one in order to display in the viewer, right? And then the storage also happens in here. Later on, after that it's finished, you can start using the client-side part. So the client-side part, which is the view in 3JS, the embed on the web page, and various JavaScript APIs that you can add in order to interact with the website can happen there. OK? So like I said, the workflow kind of goes like this. So you register an app, you get the access token, which will expire every 30 minutes. And later on, you create a bucket. So if you guys have used Amazon Web Services before, bucket, basically it's a container where you're going to be storing your, your files, your translated files. You upload the file to the bucket, you request it to translation, and then you access it to the client. OK? So let's start with this. If you guys cannot see it, let me know. Better? Yeah. OK, so 13 steps pretty quickly once actually to go through. The first one was try to be your life. Well, I just show you a couple of examples. We tried it. Sign up and sign in. I'm not going to do that right now. I actually have. set of keys here, OK? But it tells you, if you cannot see that in the back, what are the steps in order to do it, if you guys want to try it. And then we need to request our token. So we have a sample here of a growth statement using that consumer key and consumer secret key that the app creates you in order to request it. So I already have it set up here in order to save some time. So we're going to copy this. We're going to authenticate. OK, so if we get the result back with the same ID, this means the token is authenticated. And the entire code for this website, we have it hosted in our GitHub repo. So now what you guys can kind of walk through and understand how this is being done. But if I will sit down here and explain every single line of this, probably spend quite some time here. OK, so then we're going to create a bucket. 
then we have three types of buckets, transients, temporary, and persistent. Um, one of them goes on every 24 hours. The other one stays for 30 days. And later on, the other one stays there until you delete it. It's not temporary for now. So we create a bucket. We get back the, the result um, with the owner of the token, create a date, and that should be actually different. Then the type of policy key and the, the access to the token itself, to the bucket itself. We want to do just get the details of that bucket in order not to create it again. We can. It's not an optional step right now. Again, we can get a list of all the supported formats. Okay. And then we're going to upload this file, a file to the bucket. Okay. So, what bucket? The one that we just created. Just triangle, and I have some reading models here. So this is um, a Fusion 360, which is a manufacturing software in the cloud to create um, 3D models. So we're gonna upload this to our bucket. Okay, and we get back in the URN. So this URN, which is attached with the name of our bucket and the name of our file. We will need it. Again, optional step. Set references is used when you have files that have parents. Like 3ds Max has a lot of different materials and parents and all that stuff. So you set up a root file and then a link file in order to obtain all the materials inside of your, of your 3D model. We're going to encode this URN Bay64. In order for our viewer to understand it and identify it inside of our servers. And then we're going to start translating. Okay, so we got a result of successful. And then it does have a thumbnail, yes, it does have 2D viewing, and it does have 3D viewing. We can check the status of how our file is doing. Right now, it takes a little bit. So, let me tell you how big is this model actually. So this model is 13.4 megabytes. Well, it will take two, three minutes, something like that. So we're gonna leave it there for now. We're gonna continue. Okay. So the client side JavaScript API part, it's pretty simple. So on your page, you need to reference the following libraries in order to have access to the to the viewer um, API. Okay, and um, so we will start with these two libraries here. Okay. Later on. Um, this always raises the question, why we're using a div and not a canvas if we're using WebGL or WebJS. <coughs> Actually, the API kind of got built in order for you to use the div to create your entire scene inside of it in order to populate it with the, with the viewer itself. So in this case, we're going to use a div with the ID of the viewer in order to display the content. And then we have a function, which is the initialized one, here, so it takes the the name of our model, okay, and since we were using what is this thing here, the encoded URL, let me just click the check stuff. Not yet. So we were using this one. I'm gonna replace it. Okay. And then after that, it's going to tell us to create a token. In this case, this sample HTML, it's a, it's a hard-coded token. So this thing needs to be uh, refreshed every 30 minutes. After this, I'm going to show you with a Node.js server how to avoid that. And that way, you don't have to be hard-coding uh, the token itself. So like I said, you should write your own token. So we do have a token available up here, if you remember. So 
So we're going to use this one. Okay. Then the load document function that will that will take care of the the first starting of the geometry in the viewer. Okay. All right. So. Let's see how this thing is doing. It's still there. All right. I don't know how quickly the internet from here is, but it's fine. Okay. So for some resources, I'll show you some other stuff. Um, this actually, this sample, got built using uh, Polymer. How many of you guys have heard of Polymer before? Cool. All right, so basically, again, interaction in your own website. Pretty, sim pretty simple. And, um, access to shades, reflections. Um, and then we have other ones that can be loaded on top of here. But let's show this one, actually. I like this one a lot. Can you guys see okay there? Yeah? All right, so this is also a really cool car model. It was done in Fusion. And what I like about this thing is since it's a, since the way that the model gets built, it's piece by piece, you have access to individual ones. Okay? Oh, no wait. There you go. So you have access to the individual pieces of the model. And now again, you have access to the metadata of the model, OK? And the cool thing about it as having it as a web application is that it also works pretty well on mobile devices, OK? If you don't believe me, I'll pull out my iPad in a bit, and I'll show you. Um, another one. We have um, a physics sample. So there is a physics library, uh, JavaScript. How many of you guys, I think it's called physics.js, if I'm not mistaken. Or it might have another name I don't remember right now on top of my head. So well, basically, it's just same again, 3D viewer, 3D model using physics in order to create the animation of this, OK? So there is there's quite some use. You can start using it <coughs> in many different ways, not only. So and also, I think it does affect uh, Yeah. So the physics library also. Um, takes consideration of gravity. OK. Let me check how this thing is going. Oh, beautiful. OK. So that same URN in the last step, it's in order to view it. So we will get load. The viewer itself here with our model already translated. Okay? But in the same way, the 65 lines of code that I have here, of an HTML file where we use the URN, we put up the token that we were using previously, and the same uh, library function of initialize and the loading document that I show you from the presentation. I always cross my fingers on this because something happens always. Well, again, load me that same model. Okay. So if we go back again to create a cube, we use this. Simpler, right? To create a full 3D model on the UI side, we use this. So there's ways now 
in order to advance on it and have beautiful 3D models being rendered in your web. Okay. How many of you guys have heard about Cloud9? Yeah. Awesome service. Discovered it not too long ago. And what I liked a lot was actually that you can host your applications pretty quickly on it. And it works pretty well. Okay. So <clears throat> all right, let's create a space here. So triangle L and B. I'm going to use a boiler great sample that I have. So, triangle, say it's meetup. Awesome. Then, I hope you guys think that too, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, so. So, Cloud9 is an IDE, right? Yeah. Yeah, sorry, I assume a lot of people actually yeah. knew what, what it was. <laughs> And the cool thing about it is that by just adding here, the uh, I guess you guys cannot see it. Sorry. Okay, adding here the the location of your of your repo, you can create your works, workspace. I'm not gonna choose a template because I already have set up a boulder plate one. And some point is gonna pop up if I want to buy it and blah blah blah. I haven't paid for it, <laughs> so still using the free version. <clears throat> I always scratch my computer with this kind of thing. So again, um, simple instructions in order to set up this. We have an npm package also for you guys to get started if you're related with that. So I, I think it's actually something pretty cool. And uh, it's pretty, pretty straightforward. What we need to do is create environment variables and this IDE uh, from, the, from the consumer key and consumer secret that we obtained from our app. Uh, also, what we need to do here, let me see if I can make this thing a little bit bigger. I think you guys can see that well. Okay. So I need to do an npm install to get all the modules necessary for the sample. Okay. Try to install. Uh, at some point, we well, I think we've already seen some of the modules. So we need to do the the. First, the npm install in order to get all the modules necessary for the sample to run. And then later on, um, okay, modules have been installed. Later on, also in the, in the location where we have our viewer class, as you can see here, we have a replace. Let's see it. Okay, so it says replace with your document URL, right? Um, we do have that document URL from we were trying. So I'm just going to copy this. One. So I'm going to replace it. Okay. Save this. Then after that, we need to go to server.js. Sorry, I'm battling with this. So we're going to run this file. And right now, it's going to actually fail because it's running the, the server JS, but we still haven't set up the, the variables in order for 
the token to understand what we're what server we're talking to. Okay, so we need to do that. So in order to set up this variable here, you do key, and I need to copy this once. So I will know this once by memory. That will be kind of scary. I don't know them. Here, another one. So Okay, let's save. Stop this. Run it once again. Quick question. Yeah. What kind of IDE is this? Is this a new browser? Yeah. What is it? It's <laughs> It's Cloud9. It's oh, called oh, Cloud9. It cloud yeah, it is Cloud9. Oh. So when you start your workspace, it loads this IDE, and you can code directly on, on the web. It's actually pretty cool. Like, when I first found out about it, I was like, whoa. <laughs> OK? Is, is there a way to keep that key information out of the source and in some cache? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, there is. Yeah, yeah exactly. No, no. It, this is just for demo purposes. Like clients will not expose this kind of keys like that. Okay. So as you see, once it's running, uh, it gives us back a uh, URL. If you guys access that from your computer, your mobile device right now, it will work. So we have. Uh, so part of the sample also uh, shows uh, extensions, how to add extensions to the viewer. So right now, I apologize for my use of this thing, but I'm not really good with the Zoom stuff and all that. OK, so we have an extension here, which is a simple uh, load unload, all right? So when this loads function just alert this function got loaded, then when it gets unload, just alert, it got unloaded. So basically, that's what it did here at the beginning. OK, so if you see same model that we translated before, we have here a load extension, unload extension. Pretty simple. In regards to extensions, we have a GitHub repo with a pretty big list of extensions. And um, let me get out of here. Because so I have, what does extensions give you exactly? Uh, functionality with the UI of the, of the viewer. So for example, if you want to add uh, buttons to that toolbar, there's an extension that I created already. For you to take a look at it, and if you want to modify it, you can. Just obviously, it will, you would not be allowed to do it in our uh, in our repo. You will have to like fork it and then create your own one and all that. But it's just just a way to kind of get uh, get you started. So are the extensions written in three JS? Three JS, yes. All the API itself is actually written in three JS. So, like I said, started with WebGL. Then 3.js kind of wrap that WebGL stuff, right? The content. Then the, the API wraps that 3.js content. Okay, so it makes it a little a lot more simpler in order to create the the, the 3D uh, content in your web. So is that viewer open source? Yeah. Okay, so I created a another one for run this one. Let me show. You.
someone likes that green color. I don't know why, but I don't. So um, this is a sample of uh, Node Gallery using Angular. We have another one using React, for those who want to like React better than Angular, I guess. Um, and this is a list of like some of the extensions that we have available on it. So um, there is way to alterate the the model itself by moving pieces of the of the geometry. The only thing that you need to remember is that the changes that you do in it will not be safe since it's a viewer, it's read only, but you will have to save them on your side. Okay. So some of the other you know, one is called workshop, kind of like focuses. Turn this off. Focuses on one of the pieces and then just do rotation of it. Okay. Um, you make measurements and another thing. Yeah. So. Measurements, you select object one to location of the other one, and you get the value on it. Okay? So, and, and those are actually extensions, right? So, whatever you can do with JavaScript can be added into the, into the viewer from the UI. You can customize it as much as you want. We have another sample using a Mongo, uh, MongoDB. Uh, a MongoDB uh, database table that you can add um, properties to to the model itself. So the properties piece that I show you, you will add your own information from your <laughs> own database. Okay. So whatever you do changes on positions on it. And if you want to keep track of them of the of the states wherever you're doing it, you cannot save them on the viewer, but you can save them on your own database and then just repopulate them whenever it gets loaded. Okay, so for example, we have this other label here. I don't know if you can see that. So this other label here, To get again the property <laughs> inside of it. Okay. So, Question. yes, you, you, this is for viewing uh, CAD. You also have the aided manufacturing of JavaScript libraries. Are you going there? Yeah. Okay. So um, CAD can eventually. Yes. Uh, what about socket integration? You guys have that going on? Firebase, perhaps, for like, for just anything involving, you know, like setting up three D models. Kind of, uh, like, because you were talking about Mongo and saving states, yeah, from objects, right? Yeah. But if you had a continuous like integration of state update, like Firebase or Socket, yeah, something. to keep like versioning and stuff like that. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, we already have it. Fine, two clients. Yeah. yeah, we we have it. Also, we have a lot of another one that I didn't show you here. It's a collaboration. Exactly. Okay. So we invite if someone has a QR scanner or something like that. You want to try? I do. Come in front, don't worry about it. Mm -hmm. You, you are? try to read it from there. 
viewer. Viewer.autodesk.io, yeah. yeah. node, yeah. gallery, yes. collaboration, meeting ID, 61, Baker Charlie. Go and, for it. Uh, yeah, cool. <laughs> uh, so what does that here. give you? you basically sync what you're so doing. So once, once he logs in, it, it's going to take me directly to the model. It's going to take you to right? the model, and then but it's going to ask you to join. Until the screen. Yeah. It's going to ask you to join, and then since I'm the host, I will be driving the presentation. So he will see the real-time uh, movement of the model that I'm doing. So I think, yeah. So you see user there. So I move it. I don't think you can move it. It's only me, the one that can move it. OK. I see yeah, a user what? that got in, but I don't know who is it. <laughs> Nobody you, else has yeah. QR code. Hello, readers. Mike's phone. There we go. All right. So yeah. So I start driving this. You will get like real time yeah. movement on it. Okay. Some I'm gonna trippy things going on. <laughs> Let me see. It's unfortunately the real estate on the smartphone isn't very big, so yeah, it's. it's um, weird. What's weird is as a the accelerometer, it's using it's my accelerometer. Back and forth. It, it actually is letting me move it. Like I can shrink. I shrink my. Is, it, is that yeah. I supposed to do like a and cardboard I'm box? It around. You can. <laughs> yeah, probably it started in VR mode. <laughs> yeah, yeah, VR two can can be. Can be used in this. <laughs> so this is, um, I think Google Docs <laughs> started the trend for collaboration online. Yeah. And um, you've taken this to 3D collaborative online models. Yes. Totally cool. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> I don't want to open it. <laughs> I didn't bring mine because we do have some of it. In this gallery, actually, um, if you access it from a mobile device, it will give you an option. Someone is playing with it. I think it's you. <laughs> uh, it gives you an option of actually starting in VR mode. So what it will do is put one viewer next to the other and work with the accelerometer in order to do the movement on it. Um, last yeah. year, I was in a hackathon, an AEC hackathon, so construction-based applications in London. And I worked with a team that used the technology in order to put four viewers in the screen um, and with a handmade kind of like Prisma-looking thing. They have a hologram of the building being like move on it. So there's a lot of different cool use for it. And we can think of some, but I think you guys make way much better ideas. So definitely, like, give it a give it a shot. Okay. So, like I said, the developer portal. We have many samples in it. We have um, access to documentation, forums, uh, blog posts, and stuff like that. Like the quick started guide that I walk you through some of the sample apps and libraries. And don't worry about it. These slides are hosted in this link. So it's for you guys to keep. OK, so you can access it. If someone in the Google Hangout is, is watching it, uh, let me try to. My wife might be watching, actually. <laughs> no, not right now. All right, so you can access the. So I'm, seeing, I'm saying hello to future people. Uh, <laughs> You can access the, the slides in here, OK? And also, here's a link of some of the, the samples that I show you today. I actually didn't show you this one. It's actually a pretty cool one, too. <coughs> so <coughs> the one that I'm showing you today is another client already using the application. And um, for some reason. Whenever I'm like connected to a projector, it takes a little bit of time to go. So what these guys do is they do simulation of air 
through their models. As you can see, again, same viewer, right? Less uh, options in here because they decided they didn't want to show that many. And actually, um, if you don't want to show that many, you can. I think I had it open yet, but then I guess I closed it. So again, simulation of air, you can do sectioning in order to see it better. And then just show the vector flowing. Okay. And if you guys would like what you see, take a screenshot. Open it up. That's it. Okay. So again, all the samples uh, and I think most of them are actually here. If I'm missing one, just remind me about it and I will add it. I think the physics one is missing from here, but I will add it. And uh, did, did you say you had comments or you were going to comment on my question earlier about customers who might not might might want to protect some of their intellectual property? That yeah. You know, there's actually too detailed amount of information here. Or, or like, what I can think of clients like that will be probably government ones, mm -hmm. for the most part. Uh -huh. Well, uh, you can host and keep your files on your own stuff, like on your own servers. They don't need to be in our servers, okay? Right. So it will be up to you to keep that security open. Well, I'm thinking. If somebody with their JavaScript, their browser basically, mm -hmm. can look at your product and do exploded views of it, then they could, in principle, that data is available for them. That then the data will be available if you show it in the in the right. Box. So as soon as you've shown it, as soon as you've given the details cool. to the browser, mm -hmm. that data is lost in the browser because it's not safe and You're not doing rights management and the browser, right? No. To protect, yeah, exactly. So, um, so now, in theory, I've got all the specifications of the model. Mm -hmm. you know, well, <coughs> uh, what I can think of is that, for example, if you have an application where you're showing this kind of data, and for you, it's very private. You will not show it. <laughs> that's why. That's why. That's what I'm thinking, right? So, but if you want to show that kind of data that for your clients it's going to be important and everything, I don't see the problem of it. So it it it, it will be really up to you. Like we're giving you the tool to show it if you want to. You don't need to, okay? Like the sample that I was. Let me just start my token because since this one is a hard coded one. Like if Amazon wanted to show you essentially the schematic of the bike, you could, if you cared enough, make that up. So mm -hmm. I can tell you my my background in this bike. is I, I worked for IBM for a long time and part of that time was for in the software group and we were in an area that was doing something called digital rights management. It's funny you say it because you know, I heard the question before and it's from someone from IBM. <laughs> sure. Well, and it's because just for, you know, so that you're all aware, there are lots of corporations, whether they're evil or not is up to you, but um, that generate intellectual property and they need and want to have users view their intellectual property and interact with that media, but they want it under their control. They want certain media to only be viewable in certain geographical locations. They want certain media to only be played at certain times of the day. They want to have the media played only with certain advertisement content included in the media, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And there's all kinds of rules for what the people who own the intellectual property want when displaying their presentation. And it's sometimes not up to the software company that it's 
creating the product like Autodesk in terms of the intellectual, they don't know the, you don't own the intellectual property. So if somebody's got a nuclear reactor and they want to display it to certain clients, but not in Iran, for instance. Yeah, no, no. You know, sense. They, they can do that with rights benefit, but in this case, as soon as it's on the browser, if you have the URI, that, that's the end of it, right? Because they can view it, and now they've got it. They can, say, see a little yes or no, but... Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, I think we probably have some high end. I we used to have some really high end customers. We do. Yeah, I we might have some that actually have nuclear reactors in them. Probably. Yeah, they should have them put that on their land. Yeah. yeah. Well, this viewing technology can be seen offline as well. See that. Yeah. Well, if, if that's a lot of worry for you guys, like for example, <clears throat> there is a way to use all this technology in an offline mode. So basically, you will not connect anyone, right? So you will keep having the same functionalities on it, but unless you want to do collaboration stuff using sockets and all that, yeah, of course. So, so the keying information to go get your model is only from the back end that's at Autodesk, but if you wanted to have that model stored locally and run the node server on your machine, you're good. And then you wouldn't need the key. Is that correct? Or do you still need the key for license agreements with Autodesk? Well, I'll say, yeah, you, you do need the key. Is it generated locally? Is it your key or is it Autodesk? It's Autodesk key. Transform file is still in the Autodesk website, right? Uh, the translation, yes. It's in the so Autodesk server. Yeah. Like you need the key and script key to get the key. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Why don't you go on that question? I thought it was going to add is um, manufacturers might want to dumb down their Autodesk model, AutoCAD model, right? It's your thing. That makes sense. Well, and or like maps introduce fictitious towns on your maps so that, you know, or fictitious parts in your Autodesk model so that if somebody goes and tries to build it, they, they you know, Jeff, Jeff Ro, <laughs> you guys know who Jeffro Bodine is? <laughs> Always ends up with three extra parts when he disassembles. That's why I guess. Sorry. No, it's okay. All right. So, so is there other plans to make a creator since you have a viewer? Like creator. Yeah. So we do have something already um, for like a specific kind of software. It's called Fusion 360. And Fusion 360, what it is, it's a, a tool to design uh, things like, like this, okay? So manufacturing for the most part. And all that happens in the cloud. So you can do design in the cloud, basically. So SolidWorks, for example, or Inventor, which is Autodesk Inventor, and then SolidWorks is a different one. Um, it's used for creating models like this, like cars and everything in relation to that. But you do it um, desktop based. Yeah. Okay, it's not web based. Yeah. But now Fusion 360 is actually going towards that direction. And it's API as well, allowing you to add more stuff on it. The viewing technology of Fusion 360 is this API that I'm showing you today. Okay. So that one first, and then you go. Sort of touching on the digital expansion stuff, but also. Formats of loading this on like a big brain and then like, are there alternative viewing methods that they're doing on like and, and it, it may legitimately be fast enough, like I'm sure it is, but yeah. but for like very large scenes that a phone might not have behind power. So, you know, is there anyone doing work with recording? 
three models of automating that, like what the script so you see like a, a video uh -huh. that plays through. Just, well, yeah, I mean, not necessarily being like this at all. It's some sort of like method for sending a video down to tell what's happening. Yeah. No, I. You can do stuff like that. Um, it will be just basically based on the use case that you want to give it to. But accessing to creating video content and all that for in the viewer, yes, like, yeah, you can. But I don't know performance-wise with the with the device how how would it go with your device, the Android one? Is that? Oh no, I, yeah, I I've got like a top line Android. Okay. Like I said, like if it is based on it, the API runs in mobile devices that has browser that support WebGL. If it supports WebGL, it runs. Obviously, in something like this, an iPad Pro will run a lot better than an iPhone 4, for example. Okay? It's different stuff like. Games itself have been evolving mm -hmm. according to what kind of hardware you have access now, right? So yeah, so there isn't anything now where it's like if you wanted to just like when I upload this video like using the just like the APEC you have mm -hmm. or, that, or someone else has the same like yeah like you know run through this script, set the camera all the way around this model so that like. I can like send down a small little video oh. of like a 3D model, which isn't really 3D viewing. It's like scrolling along the track of the video, mm -hmm. right? something like that. Yeah, yeah, you can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I I, I got lost a little bit. <laughs> like maybe, maybe yeah, Fusion 360 is also, like yeah, I said, that yeah, it's using this viewing technology. So yes. Um, yes. Any other question? You had another question. Yeah. Um, I think I don't yes, because an application can do video and then scan the real world scene and then use it for a lot of subscribers. Yeah. Is that API, is that closed with that application for video? For reality capturing? Yeah, so yeah, it does. It's actually called Recap. Like Recap is the product from Autodesk that, with pictures, it kind of like connects, connects them in order to create the three D model, and it does have an API, and it's called Recap API. Yeah, I'll I'll show you in a bit. Someone else I saw there. Yeah. Just to clarify, you had the the example of storing into a Mongo database. Yeah. Um, so I'm also hearing that the, the model is being stored with Autodesk with we're retrieving it. So yeah. what would be stored there would be the settings, maybe what was dragged or altered inside of the particular environment for the user. Is that correct? So CAD models usually come with a certain kind of metadata on it. And you can add your own ones after. But those will not get stored in the original model. In order for you to display them later to your clients and all that, you will have to access it from your own database in order to display them. Okay. Yeah. I'm trying to think where the boundary is where um, Autodesk makes money. Because I mean, you've been showing us a bunch of things for free, and you're posting models for free. We don't make money right now. <laughs> so, but Autodesk as a company makes money. So yeah. Where's Where's the boundary where you start to make money? So. OK, so the other thing, I don't want to show this, but I'll show it either way. So we have a new platform, OK? It's called Forge. What is Forge? Well, Forge is three things. Forge is going to be a conference for developers. It's going to happen in June in San Francisco. All of you guys are invited to come. And also, Forge has a fund of $100 million in order to invest developers, startups, that wish to use our web service APIs in order to build a relationship with us. And as all investment, of course, Autodesk takes a percentage of it. Okay, So I think towards the business side of it, it's kind of heading that way. 
But at some point, yes, we're going to start charging for the service of it. I don't think it's going to be something ridiculous because we are trying to move from those expensive desktop licenses into, <coughs> into cloud services now, right? So I, I don't know. So don't quote me on this because I have no idea. I don't know if it's going to be per translation or per storage of it. Yeah. But then again, people that wish to start testing it, like if you start uploading 5,000 models every day, it will make sense for you to get charged, right? But if you're someone that's starting to take a look at the API, playing around with it, checking it out any now and then, I don't see that point. We want people like you guys to give it a shot, try it, make beautiful 3D websites, because the technology is available now. We keep seeing a lot of content and all that. And I, when I think of a 3D website is that it keeps your customer engaged for more time because he's just having fun in it, okay? So why not take advantage of that technology that already exists? Okay. So, yeah. yeah, so we, we have a, an upcoming uh, rendering API that it will show, like, the thing is, like, we showed this technology at a VR meetup, and we got destroyed. <laughs> <laughs> we, we got destroyed. That's what happened. And honestly, like, yeah, um, this doesn't look as good as what you can do today with VR, right? But, well, only. No, but I mean the, the kind of like the, the aesthetic on it, like the, the, vis the visual content, like. VR itself right now, you can do a lot of really, really nice looking applications, right? That kind of transport you to different places, right? Give me one second, let me yeah. finish. And then, um, so the the rendering service that we have, it, it creates a really, really nice looking environment in order for VR applications to be more attractive to it. So we are working on it, like it's coming. We have some samples. If you guys have Google Cardboards, I can give you a URL where you can check it out, and it looks pretty good. Yeah, like uh, if you want to see it, actually. Well, so do, does your viewer have a stereo mode where you can see two images that are separated stereoscopically? Yeah. OK, so you already have the software. Yeah, there. we do. It just doesn't look as good as all the other oh. stuff. <laughs> yeah. But this rendering service does look good, OK? But the API for this one, it's not exposed yet. It does exist, but it's not exposed. So it's coming, OK? So if you guys want to try it, like give it a shot in your mobile devices, alpano.autodesk.com. Yeah, my bad. No, not that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let me. Or so just do a like text yeah. file. Yeah, I can put it on the meetup too. So alpano.autodesk.com. <clears throat> and with the we came out with a new <clears throat> game engine. It's called Stingray. I don't know if you guys have heard about it. It's looking pretty good. So Stingray, it's in collaboration with uh, using 3ds Max Maya, Maya LT, in order to create like really nice looking games from start to finish, like from menu to ending credits of your game. Okay, mobile mobile games, uh, web games all kinds of different games. And at the same time, that same game engine, because of all the visualization and rendering uh, power that it has, it's been it's being used uh, for the AC industry too. So uh, displaying like a, 
an upcoming complex of apartments with VR, you can look at it through like that. So if you go to that website, you can kind of get an idea of what I mean. Like I said, if you guys have a cardboard later, you can just put the phone in it and then give it a shot. And I know you had a question. Uh, yeah. The, uh, the view of the, um, like the viewer for the 3D models. Yeah. Uh, you said everything is pretty much customizable in terms of UI. Yeah. Um, can you remove the border and remove everything else? Yeah. And just have the model be everything. Free? Yeah. How about uh, 3DS, what you can do, animation and stuff? So I'm if you thinking can... where I'm going to use this model. So mm -hmm. let's say I created some models, I put them in. Can I use it some kind of like UI element, just animate, you yeah. know? Do, it, do I have that kind of access? Yeah. So, so I can make interactive websites. So, you know. Do you have model collisions? Do you have multiple objects and uh, a 3D space where you can detect edge collisions and are you a gaming environment or can you get there? Because mm. you, you showed a robot and one of the industry issues in robotics is um, for AI is getting it real interaction with 3D spaces. Like I've got an object and I can see it. Okay. It's, it's a block and I can close my gripper on it and things like that. Yeah. Now you can load like multiple instances of models in the viewer at the same time. At some point, I think you might be able to do collision of it. When I think of collision with 3D, I think of clashes in the AC industry. Um, um, well, I mean, collision is any time, like yeah, yeah. if you have a React model or whatever, you want to do something when you, you know, your airplane flies into a wall. Exploded. Exploded. <laughs> yeah, I guess. I guess it will be about to try it. I don't. I, I'm. I don't know. I haven't tried. So. Any other questions? Yes. Do you see people in putting this into e-commerce? Um, are there any? Is that happening in production? Uh. Amazon is in. <laughs> So yeah, I think I don't know like on top of my head right now of someone that is using it directly in e-commerce, but uh, I do see potential of using it in e-commerce. So if it's nobody using it right now, I guess that's a good opportunity. Yeah, like are there any big names using this API? Depending of what do you call big names? Because I can tell you companies that are like completely huge, like I don't know if you know a construction company called GE Don or GPR, which are like pretty big. Probably big in that industry, right? Yeah, exactly. So it, it just depends what, what you call like big. Um, so the, the conference that that we are promoting, which is going to happen in, in June in San Francisco. Um, our biggest sponsor right now is actually Amazon Web Services. Since basically. Since hosted on Amazon? Yeah. And we're going to have like quite some like good lineup of speakers. I think someone from my company was trying to get Elon Musk. So we'll see. You never know, right? He's doing cool stuff with manufacturing and all that. So, but yeah, so I don't know. Like I said, it depends on what do you call big companies. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but Amazon is not using the viewer. I think it's giving us the service of it. So, if they want to use the viewer at some point. I don't know much to, about that part. I'm not on the business development side of the company, I guess. Any other questions? No? All right. So the beginning I said I was going to do like a live poll. <laughs> um, 
I kind of want to get your thoughts on something that I'm, I'm working on. It. So it's, it's an IoT sample using Philips Hue lights. Do you guys know that? Yeah. yeah. So I set up my apartment with all these lights in it. I also have a Sonos speaker, and I bought a Canary webcam. So what I want to do is I'm building a 3D model of my apartment. And what I do, I want to do a, a stage one of my sample. It's to control lights, sound, and video directly from the viewer. Stage two will be get the data of the consumption of energy that the lights are generating every time they're on and display them with some kind of graphic, OK? My question will be, does that sound like an OK sample? Like, do you guys see, if you will see something like this in a demo, would that be something cool to look at it? Do you see some value? It depends on if you're turning on the lights in your house during the demo. Yeah. Oh yeah, no, that's that's the point. That's the That'd reason awesome. I wanna. That's the reason I wanna have the camera. So I wanna have, um, like a. I wanna, I wanna have like three docking. No, two docking panels, right? One of the docking panels is gonna have a live streaming to the apartment, and the other one is gonna control the lights. So I'm gonna click on it, and in the camera you're gonna see the lights go on. The reason I have this camera is because also receive sound. So I have a way to control the Sonos speaker and listen to the Sonos to my computer that I turn in inside of my house. So what I found out right now is that the Hue lights, the bridge of the Hue lights can be accessed. I can already control it. Like I already have uh, an OJS server controlling my lights when I'm inside of my house. The thing is like the bridge, the API, it only allows it to use right now when you're inside of the house. So I think I have to set up like a Raspberry Pi inside of my house in order to connect to it and start interacting with it. The other way will be using IFTTT. Have you guys heard about it? That's another way. So I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm still in the size in which route to go. Have you heard of Beagleboard? Beagleboard was another. Yeah, it has already not even installed everything. So okay. just do port touring. And you access the Cloud9 the same way, and you can you know have your own JavaScript. So Bitcoin is already everything covered on. Okay. So it's cool. Definitely, I'll take a look at it. Like one of my one of my teammates actually wire up his entire house. I cannot show you that demo because he lives in France and it's pretty late right now. <laughs> so he wire up his entire house with sensors for temperature, also the garage door to open and close. And directly from the viewer, he can open and close windows, door, everything. And having a, an IP a webcam live streaming the, the thing. So I kind of go in, in that, that direction. And the value that I see for me to be a little bit more attractive is probably the stage two, when I can start analyzing the data of the, of the consumption of energy of the light. So I can check what. Con Ed, which is the electricity company in New York, charged me for this amount of uh, energy that I use during the month or something like that. You kind of have a graph of my expenses into the house. So I don't know. I'm just trying to, I'm thinking of, yeah. I think it would be a lot more impressive to kind of rendering of your apartment took the data from the poles and in real time changed the lighting of the render. And then you use the camera as proof that your render was real time and reflected the actual position of the lights. Okay. So you have maybe a bar at the top that controls each light and then one frame that shows using Autodesk say a guy, yeah. a render of the part show or something. And yeah. flip on the camera to say, look, it's this is my fish tank at home. I control everything. I can see the history there. So you oh, can yeah. check out that. And in your car, down there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I've been using this. Yeah, definitely. Well, you have an access to the UK tank. Yep. Yeah. And the car map on another song oh. that you want to make it up. Yeah. And then drag and drop that car map on yours and change the bulbs. 
I think what, what he's saying, it sounds pretty good, but I guess maybe stage three of my sample. <laughs> <laughs> Baby steps, right? Baby steps. I, I'm pretty new with IoT. I've never done anything. Well, the only thing that I've done is I, I hacked the BB-8, the Sphero thing, using Cylon.js and control it from here, but that's it. I haven't done anything else. One of my colleagues actually put up the BB-8 model in the viewer, and he can control it from the viewer now. So this well, that sample also is in our GitHub. So if you guys have a BB-8 and want to try it, go right ahead. But for me, IoT is still like baby steps. So I need to understand a little bit how, how <coughs> hardware works and all that. So I don't know. I just like to interact with the people that I'm presenting at by asking this because if I'm going to spend time working on a sample and you guys don't see, oh, that's cool, I'm wasting my time. So <laughs> I got to think of something else. But if you guys think it's, it's, it's a good start, I guess, later on I want to like kind of have connection of the Sonos music to interact with the lights and that being shown in the viewer. But like I said, baby steps first. OK? Um, so again, my name. If you guys need anything, please let me know about it. I had fun. I hope you guys didn't get bored. Please, there's still a lot of pizza. <laughs> I hate wasting food. One experience that I had last year was that we hosted a Node.js meetup in New York. We have one of my colleagues come from Switzerland. He's this Node.js master. So we were very excited for him to come and show that. And the thing is, like, I got confused with the organizers because I presented a Node.js meetup before, and it was packed. It was really nice. So I thought it was the same one. But for some reason, like half halfway through the day, I started noticing that I think these like, guys are not the same ones. And then I get an email from the from the host, like, oh, yeah, something came up. Uh, I cannot show up. So would you guys be OK without me? I'm like, yeah, sure. It seemed like it was a pretty good, a pretty new meetup. <laughs> 150 people at RSVP, 15 showed up. Wow. And we have food for 80 people. Yeah. So it was. <laughs> What I ended up doing was that I called a couple of my friends, gave them some pizzas. Some of the guys that came took a pizza also. And then I just have my friends help me out, give it away to the homeless. And that was it. I hate wasting food. So if you guys can help us out with pizza, that would be amazing. And yeah, so it's it's been fun. Thank you very much for your time. I hope it was of some use. And if you guys uh, want to stay over and then keep talking about it and all that, by all means, all right? I don't have anywhere to go. Okay. Okay, last request. Uh, I need to take a picture of all of you guys. So kind of merge in together. <laughs> I don't have like a wide uh, wide length. Uh, Hello. Yeah. Hello. Ready? Turn this way. See someone back in there. Ah, uh, no, you know what? Yeah, they're probably That's what I was there. <laughs> Sorry, I forget yeah, about these new things. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, don't move. Or now you're going to be cut off. Yes, we can. Like, everybody just move. After you start, yeah, everybody move. <laughs> 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 everybody move. 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 Everybody